الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا اما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القران المجيد بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فأما الإنسان إذا ما ابتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعمه فيقول ربي أكرما وأما إذا ما ابتلاه فقدر عليه رزقه فيقول ربي أهانا كلا بل لا تكرمون اليتيم ولا تحاطون على طعام المسكين وتأكلون التراث أكلا لما وتحبون المال حبا جما كلا اذا دكت الارض دكا دكا وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا وجيء يومئذ بجهنم يومئذ يتذكر الانسان وانى له الذكرى يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياته فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه احد ولا يوثق وثاقه احد يا ايتها النفس المطمئنه ارجعي الى ربك راضيه مرضيه فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي صدق الله العلي العظيم وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قد افلح من اسلم ورزق كفافا وقد وقنعه الله بما اتاه او كما قال عليه الصلاه والسلام أما بعد. Honorable brethren, respected sister in Islam, after hosting a very successful youth oriented program last night, featuring a long question and answer session, something that was constantly being asked, or the tone that was used, that was being used to ask any of those particular questions had inspired what I would like to address today. And those questions were along the lines of, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of all this, then on earth, why is all of this happening? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mighty, overpowering, powerful, capable, knowledgeable, then why is there poverty? Why is there struggle? Why do we have to go through this? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put me through this? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala putting the world through this? And questions along those lines. If Allah is, then why is this happening? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses this type of a thought process in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Fajr, which is why I recited the entire passage before us because of how powerful it is and I intend to share with you the majority of it today. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us, or he, he tells us rather, what our state of mind is. And at the end he tells us how we can avoid that state of mind to abstain from any type of repercussion that might happen on account of having the first type of thought process. And be entered into the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on account of having the latter. He starts off by telling us about the state of human beings. But Ahmad insan, as far as human beings or man is concerned, when his Lord tests him. What do you think about when you think about a test? You think about something difficult, something, something that's overpowering you, something that you can't go through. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first uses the term tests him, he right away couples it with وَنَعْمَهُ أَكْرَمَهُ I'm sorry. He dignifies him, he honors him, he blesses him. And then he gives him bounties. 
then our state, our response to that situation is, wow, my Lord has, has honored me. And not in a way of appreciation or gratitude that Alhamdulillah for what Allah has given me. Now what can I do for someone else? No. Rather, you know, I have what I have because I earned it. I have what I enjoy because I deserve it. I'm entitled to this, so thank you Allah, you did a good job with me. You gave me what, you, what I deserve. That's what type of an attitude we have. And then we really start believing that we're good people because we have a lot of stuff. We really start believing that, subhanAllah, nothing is wrong with us because things are going smoothly in life. But this, like, entitlement crisis is, is something that, that can really jeopardize our faith in this world and the next world. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure is not directly associated with what's going on in our life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure with us can't solely be determined by the smooth sailing nature of our life. By His favors, no. Because sometimes favors aren't really favors. We see them as favors. We see excessive amounts of wealth as, as, as a favor, as a bounty. But it can actually be a trap. Allah talks about that situation in the Quran. Where when people really start believing that everything is, is good because or I'm good because everything is good, Allah says, these people really fall in the trap of transgression of Allah, of rebelling against Allah because they feel like now I can do anything. Everything is good so I can do anything. And Allah says that, um, before, before I, I'm, I'm losing the, the, the verse that's, come, that's supposed to come to my head at, at this time, so I'm going to share another verse of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about someone who actually went through this type of a crisis. In Surah Al-Kahf, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about an individual who had two gardens. And he would constantly look at those two gardens, ignore all the advice that people would give him pertaining to the fact that you need to give back to the community. This, might, this is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it might be taken away from you. But all that man would say was, مَا أَظُنُّ أَن تَبِيدَ هَذِهِ abada." I don't think this is ever going away. This is here to stay. Whatever I have, I've earned it. I know how to keep it. I got this. It's, it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. I don't even think the day of judgment is coming anytime soon. The day of judgment, all oh yeah, that that day of judgment, all that is is a talk of the future. It's not coming anytime soon. It's not going to afflict me. My wealth is here to stay. I'm here to stay. My prosperity, I earned it. I built it. I know how to take care of it. It's not going anywhere. Even if I do have to go back to my Lord, I'll find even more good. Turn around, meaning like my good will be transformed into a, or transmuted into a hereafter version of good. I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, you know, uh, when, when people really feel like they got everything in the world, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not there, and, and He's just somewhere there in the background, and if, if everything goes to, 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 you know, a south direction, then it's all going to work out for me because everything is good right now. They start continuing their disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, When they get really, really happy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He suddenly seizes them, then they're shook, then they don't know what to do, then they don't, don't know which direction to go. So goodness, prosperity, that's the opening of the lecture. Goodness, prosperity is not a sign necessarily that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you or He doesn't. It can be a good thing if you're using it for good, if it's humbling you, if it's making you more humble than when you didn't have. Alhamdulillah, it's good. If you're using it to help other people, Alhamdulillah, it's good. If you're using it in such a way where you're impacting society around you to make it a more comfortable place for everybody else to be, Alhamdulillah, it's good. But if it's just making you complacent, if it's just making you stuck in your little bubble of whatever you think is right, if it's just making you continue your bad habits, if it's just allowing you to just do what you gotta do without fear of repercussion, then it's a trap. 
It's a trap. And then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes it away and we're shook, He talks about the next situation in the very next verse. Now as far as when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests him, uses the term testing again. Not, not a big test where he takes away everything that you ever had. Tests that a lot of us feel like are tests on us today. A little restrainment, a little constrainment of substance. You're not making as much as you used to before. Bank balance is looking a little dry. It's looking a little more bland. It's looking like, you know what, as much as I thought I could do with my life or with my money, I won't be able to do that with you. It takes a little bit away from us. What do we start saying? What do we say it explicitly or we say it subconsciously? What does the, the human being say? Oh, my Lord has disgraced me. You disgraced me. Humiliated me. Why me? What did I do to deserve this? And subhanAllah, when, when that happens, that's usually when people start questioning everything else in life. When people go through some personal tragedy, they feel like, okay, I'm going through this and to help myself feel better about complaining about the situation, about venting about their own situation, they look for other examples to support their cause. As if they're presenting a case of God is not fair, Allah is not fair, I have my case as an example, and now I'm gonna gather as many as cases as I can of oppression, of injustice, of tyranny across the world to make sure my case looks presentable, that God is not fair. Then situations where people are starving across the globe affect us. Then we not affect us in a way of what we can do about it, you know, why did God do this if God is all capable? Then situations like when people's homes are being destroyed or people's families are being slaughtered and all of that, all of that really saddening stuff, why is Allah allowing this to happen? Oh, my Lord has destroyed me, he has humiliated me, has disgraced me. That's what these lies lead to. Us questioning the fairness of Allah. But guess what, my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam? We all have, as much as we don't like to hear it, Allah is all capable, but when it comes to things in this world, we all have a choice. We all have free will. Whatever happens to us, whether it's an individual crisis or a collective community struggle, it's because of our doing. Allah says, Wa ma asala kumi musiba. Whatever difficulty or calamity befalls you, is because of what your hands have earned, what you have done. Somebody once said very beautifully, I once thought of asking God why he allows suffering to happen. But I was afraid that he would ask me the same question. Allah has, Allah has sent down enough food in the world to feed everybody. It's our distribution that's the problem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down enough resources, enough wealth in this, in, in this world that all the rich can help out the poor. And Allah has designed the system that way because if there weren't any poor, if there wasn't poverty, then the concept of charity wouldn't exist. Allah has in, sent enough money for wealthy people to help out those in need. It's just our distribution that's a problem. It's just our lack of desire for charity that's, that's a problem. It's not the tough situation that we're, we're, we're facing in life. That's the problem. It's what we decide to do about that tough situation. It's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the capacity to do, but we don't want to do and try to justify it by saying that we can't do it. That's the problem. Allah says very profoundly, eloquently, and authoritatively, and truthfully in the Quran, La yukallifu Allah nafsan illa us'aha. Allah doesn't burden a soul beyond what they can bear. Showing us that whatever He puts you through, you have the capacity to come out of it. 
What are you going to do about it, O oh humans? If I put you through sickness, you have the means to ride that sickness with absolute grace. If I give you wealth, you have the capacity to donate. You, if I gave you knowledge, you have the capacity to help people, not to twist things to serve your own favor. You have, if I gave you platform and position, you have the authority and the ability to help people using that platform, not to make things convenient for yourself. If I gave you poverty, you have the ability to and the capacity to display perseverance. Allah gives all of these favors and these favors are tests to see if we will treat it as a favor or we will treat it as a punishment. The Prophet وسلم, if, if the sign of someone being loved by Allah was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was making everything go nice and smoothly in their lives, the Prophet وسلم, wouldn't have went through any tragedies. But like Imam Al-Qurtubi Rahimahullah says very, very beautifully that there's no tragedy imaginable to mankind that the Prophet ﷺ didn't go through. Started off by being, you know, somebody who didn't have a father. And in Arabic, a yadim, an orphan, is classified by somebody not having their father, only a mother. The age is six, his mother is taken away. In the care of his grandpa, his grandparents are taken away. After that, it's tossed around between his uncles, finally until Abu Ladab comes in, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests him by making him successful. A successful businessman, a successful merchant. He made good money. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him through wealth, and he rode that test of wealth out with absolute grace. The most charitable person, the most noble person, a sadiq, the most truthful person, the most al amin, the most trustworthy person. Allah, he passed the, the test of wealth with lying colors. Thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed, blessed him with the test of abject poverty. From sadiq al amin, the truthful and the honest, to somebody who is estranged. Nobody wants to deal with him anymore. Everybody is calling him sahib, sorcerer, majnoon, somebody who is bewitched, somebody who has been masfoo, somebody who has been, uh, you know, affected by the evil eye or by magic, somebody who is a kahin, a fortune teller, a sorcerer, all of these weird, nasty, and bizarre names. Right after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his wife away, Khadija radiallahu anha, his rock of support. Thereafter, his uncle Abu Talib, in the same exact year, thereafter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took, took that state and gave him authority. Where he had authority now to establish himself to such an extent where he can see his retribution from anybody who caused him harm. But rather he chose to forgive. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took six of his seven children away. Ask a, a parent what happens to them when they lose one child. Six of his seven children he had to bury with his own hands. Thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just, you know, gave him this, this whole life where it's just a roller coaster of test, test upon test. And guess what he did with it? He made something of his life. He made an absolute amazing thing of his life by conveying to us this beautiful religion. He's a human being just like us. He had no godly qualities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allah alone. The Prophet sallallahu wasn't blessed with any of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, obviously those qualities which Allah shares with human beings like mercy, etc. Yes, but when it comes to the capability control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, none of that was given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He was an average human being just like us. That's what made him great. That's what made him outstanding. That's what made him somebody who went through all of this. He could have cracked, but he didn't crack. He took that pressure to propel him to do the good that he did. SubhanAllah, that to an extent where Umar bin Khattab anhu walks in the Prophet's room, he sees him sleeping on a straw mat. And when he gets up, all the marks from that straw mat are on his back. And Umar bin Khattab anhu just begins to cry uncontrollably. A strong, solid, concrete man like Umar bin Khattab, crying like a baby, the Prophet sees this and he says, Ma ya kika ya Umar, what is making you cry, O Umar? Why are you crying? 
Umar says like, man, the Prophet of Allah, I've seen the kings of, of, of Rome and Persia. It's like, I've seen these people, they live in luxury, they, live in, they have so much of you. Look, look, look at what, what, what I see. That's why I'm crying. The Prophet smiles at him and he says, I'm not telling Allah, Ya Umar, I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you, I'm not Aren't you happy? Aren't you content, O oh, Allah, that they have this world and we have that its world? Because this life, my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam, is a test. It's not meant for us to only have bliss upon bliss upon bliss. And bliss is not defined. We can have perpetual bliss even in this life, but it's not defined by happy situations and circumstances. Bliss means you are content with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts you for. Whether it's, and it's not even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa it's, you know, the people of today too, the people who are struggling back wherever it is that they're struggling, their homes are being destroyed, they're coming back home to deceased parents from school. SubhanAllah, they, 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 they're, they're not fasting because they, they want to, or because they have nothing to eat. These people, SubhanAllah, they wanted to break, they could have broken the but subhanAllah, the fact that they went through all of what they went, they, they went through, and they still, if you ask them, you know, what's going on? Are these people are ever going to make you cry? No. Allah is with us. Help is going to come. Help is going to come. These solid people of places like Palestine, Pakistan, Syria, all of these places. If you look at the smile on these noble souls, these people are making it despite the struggle that they're going through. And over here, we want to complain if our Wi-Fi goes wrong. We want to complain if our, if our electricity is cut out for like a few hours. We want to complain about situations like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes one job away from us. There's people out there who don't even have an opportunity to get any job because there, there is no job that exists. SubhanAllah, if they're making it, then Allah has tested us with much less. We can make it too. We just need to react and respond appropriately. We need to be able to tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I did what I could do. I made the best with what I had. You know, that's what, that's what you know, the people of the past would do. They would look at what they had and make the best of the situation. They would try to bring about change to the situation of themselves and the world around them by acting, by doing something. I'm going to close with this. Umar bin Abdul Aziz was one of the greatest walafa after the Sahaba radiallahu anhu when he stepped to the position first. And by the way, some people really feel like these people, you know, have to go some gray hairs on their face or like go through a, a phase in life to wise up. No, this man was the governor of Medina at 25 years old. He was the Khalifa at 38 years old. First thing he did when he got there was establish that all of my family members who are not paying their zakat properly, I'm going to collect zakat from them first. He didn't care if that's, that's family. No. I want to make sure the right thing happens. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him, he used it to make a difference. What are you doing to make a difference with what Allah has given you? Instead of looking at what somebody else has. Instead of what, looking what materialistic opportunity somebody else is presented with. Allah knows His creation better than we know ourselves and any other of His creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how to distribute. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows who to give to and who not to give to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that if He gave you something that you, sh you, you don't need right now, then it will corrupt you. So out of His compassion for you, He gives you exactly what you need. And that's what we need to do, to take what we have and make the best of this situation. Instead of complaining about the fact that life isn't fair to me, why me, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, when, and, and these verses, how they close, is When all of this happens, the hour is established, the day of judgment is there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels are there, the earth starts cracking open and, and Jahannam is brought, and subhanAllah, oh, when all of this happens, at that day you'll remember, you'll have a, a very sharp, strong memory of all the opportunities you have. 
وأنا لهم ذكرى what's remembrance at that time will be يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي we'll start saying that I wish I had put something forth for my life and that's a very profound usage of words because I had put something forward for my life that means everything before this wasn't actually life it was just a test Allah says وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ the hereafter, that is life. That is, that is when you only live once. You don't only live once here. This is not even living. This is just a place for tasks. What are we going to do to make what make something of whatever we've been given? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me and all of us the ability to not be those who complain before too late. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow me and all of us to use whatever we have at our disposal to make the best of whatever situation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us in. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us wealth, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow it to, to make us closer to Him, to draw us closer to His mercy and away from His wrath. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had, had placed us in poverty, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to see the blessing in that poverty and allow us to persevere like He wants us to persevere. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to only do that which we, we must do, not that we waste it all away by complaining that life isn't fair, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to implement and promote.